Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be covering part two of the murder and abduction of Adam Walsh. So if you're not familiar with the case, please check out part one, which is the video just preceding this one. Today we're going to be talking about the suspect, Otis Elwood Tool and his timeline. Regarding his timeline, the Hollywood Police Department did a good job tracking down everywhere he had been to the best of their ability in July of 1981 in the surrounding months. In the case file, State of Florida case file that was released to the public, you can see that they called the hospitals, they called the gas stations, they called the blood banks, they called the churches. And you can literally go day by day through the surrounding months and time that Adam went missing and track all his comings and goings. And I thought, well, should I put in all the receipts and all the different bits of information from the case file that they found? And I thought that's, that's too intensive. So I'm going to give you a brief overview. We know that Otis Tool was in Florida because on May 16, 1981, his mother died and she was buried three days later and he was in Jacksonville, Florida around this time. We also know that in June of 1981, Tool took his brother's blue Ford truck, his brother Howell. He took his truck to dump some scrap iron and was supposed to share the proceeds with Howell. But instead, Tool took the vehicle and his niece and nephew, Frida, Powell and Frank Powell and he went to Maryland with Henry Lee Lucas. Now as a side note they all end up getting separated in Maryland. Otis leaves Frank and Frieda with Henry Lee Lucas of all people and so I'm not going to get off track with that story. Let's just keep it with the timeline regarding Adam. On July 8th 1981 the Delaware police contact Howell Tool that his burned up vehicle was found abandoned and we know that Tool was fond of burning things. So that gives us a timeline of where that vehicle was. On July 22nd, Tool was in contact with a man, Father Griffin, of the Immaculate Conception Church, and he was found all disoriented on the church grounds, saying that he was depressed and suicidal. So Father Griffin took him to the crisis unit of the hospital, and he was interviewed at the hospital. He was released at midnight. Father Griffin took Tool to a Warwick Hotel and he paid for a one night stay there. But in the morning, the father took Tool back to the hospital, Riverside Hospital, where he was admitted on July 23rd, 1981 at 1030 for depression. He was placed in the psych unit. But Tool later went against medical advice and he signs himself out on July 24th at 236 p.m. So that puts him in Newport News, Virginia, at that time. So Tool signs himself out of the hospital and he's, it's July 24th, 1981. He's in Newport News, Virginia. He goes to the Salvation Army and he requests assistance to get back to Jacksonville. So he shows his social security card and the Salvation Army writes him, writes a check to the Greyhound Bus Corporation that day for a ticket to Jacksonville. In order to firm up the timeline, the police looked at the Greyhound bus schedules to determine when Tool arrived in Jacksonville. And he said that he didn't get off at any stops from Newport News to Jacksonville. So they figured that he arrived on July 25th, 1981. Tool then claimed once he got there back home, he went to Southeast Color Coat Roofing. That's where he worked occasionally. And that also he went to where his wife lived. He said that he went on the lot at River Brothers Roofing and obtained the Cadillac that's the one that he had bought from Faye McNett, but that she had repossessed because he quit making payments on it. Arguably, Tool had no money. He was going to the Salvation Army to get a bus, to beg a bus ticket to Jacksonville. So at this point in the story, Tool was bro broke as a joke in Jacksonville. And when this was pointed out to him in interviews and in interrogations he later tailored his confession and claimed that once he got to Jacksonville he retrieved $300 from a tin can from under his mother's burned out house. Believe that if you will. And here's the part of the timeline the police have trouble with because they could not verify where he was during Adam's disappearance. They 
can strongly believe by the bookended timelines that he was in Florida, but they don't know exactly where he was because he says that on July 26, he went down to Biscayne Bay, Miami to turn some tricks. And if he had $300 from a tool from a tin can you wonder why he'd be turning tricks in Biscayne Bay but that's what he said and we all know that Adam was abducted from the mall in Hollywood Florida on July 27th on August 1st 1981 Tool and his wife Rita Norvella moved into Betty Goodyear's boarding house it's like an apartment but I think she just basically had houses and she rented out different rooms And Betty Goodyear did provide a receipt that she rented a room to Tool on July 31st, 1981. And on August 1st, there was an incident that was recorded in a police report wherein his brother Hal came to Betty Goodyear's apartment, the rooming house, and Hal was looking for Tool. And he he was mad at him for stealing that vehicle that he found that was burned out. And so basically he tracked down tool at a little champs market there in jacksonville and he assaulted him so there's a a police report to back up this incident that happened on august the first just note that investigators were unable to pin down tools location between july 26th and july 30th 1981 so basically the time around adam's kidnapping and murder in addition to the police tool allegedly confessed to many people including his cellmates one cellmate, James Collins slash Wilkes, said that T- Tool was flamboyant and while in jail, Tool asked Collins what would happen to a child killer in jail. Throughout the years, the Walsh family's been very critical of the Hollywood Police Department's handling of this case. From the searches, from laying too hard on the family and the people surrounding the family as suspects not getting other agencies involved and the way that the local the state and the federal government and the FBI handled missing children's cases in general they just it wasn't good enough John Walsh has said that he thought that the handling of this case was bumbling and botched And at one time, the chief replied back that he thought the detectives were too close to the family and friends of John and Reve, and that basically that things weren't done professionally because they answered telephones, they reviewed the tapes, and that the family was involved in every stage of the investigation. And that they said that caused a distraction because police officers are supposed to be like scientists and you need to leave emotion out of your ring of pursuit and that that messed with them being objective. Oh, Lord have mercy. By the way, I don't think this is the Hollywood Police Department stance today, but this was something that was printed at the time. Let me read you this excerpt. Years later, Walsh talked to me about the initial police reaction when Adam was missing. There was nothing, Walsh said. Reve and I went over to the Hollywood Police Department and they stumbled and bumbled along. We got no help. It was heartbreaking. Walsh also found there was little communication between state, local, and federal agencies when a child was missing. Valuable time was lost. Jacksonville homicide detective J.W. Bud Terry was alleged to have been in a book deal with Tool. And people then began to suspect that Terry may have fed Tool information about the Walsh case and that Tool did not have or no unique information about the case. However, if you look here, the first person that Tool hinted to an obscure reference to about to killing a child was to Kendrick, not Terry. Either way, discussions of book deals are, are never a good thing. So we're talking about the later years investigation. And in 1995, the evidence that was considered was the machete and the canvas sheath because the sheath had presumptive positive tests for blood. There was tape from a machete handle. There was the bayonet that Tool had got from his sister, allegedly. And there was some carpet from Jacksonville, but then that was found to have been destroyed. There was Adam's hair sample, which later was known to be degraded. 
There was clothing from the backyard of Tool's mother's house, which we now we know now was not Adam's. They had no blood sample of Adam to compare to anything, and they didn't even know Adam's blood type. So there was blood in the 1971 Cadillac, but the blood at that time was not substantial enough to yield a result as to whether it was even animal or human, much less which human. You know, was it Adams? We don't know. Now that the evidence is lost, we will never know. If you look at the files as released to the public from the state, state of Florida, you'll notice that the autopsy, the physical autopsy, is missing from the file. It's my personal opinion that it's not truly missing. It just wasn't released to the public. That's just my opinion. Uh, there's 10,000 pages in the file. I'm sure they thought they could just someone this is my opinion guys that maybe someone didn't want it floating around on the internet the pre-autopsy information is there and then all the discussion regarding the autopsy is in there but just not the physical autopsy as mentioned in part one this is the part in the story where the teeth from the recovered mandible were reviewed and found to have the same mitochondrial dna as reve walsh these remains were of Adam Walsh, and the DNA is now on file for Adam. The instrument of death, or the instrument that beheaded Adam, was also noted to be heavy bladed and left scratches, scrapes, and indentations on the remains. But note, no matching instruments are in evidence. None of the instruments that were provided for comparison are in evidence. In September of 1995, the Sears non-uniform security guard, Kathy Schaefer, was located and she was re-interviewed and then she now believed that it had been Adam Walsh that she escorted from the store. She said she was 85% sure it had been Adam and she had been hesitant to speak out because so many people blamed her for the actions that led to Adam's demise. I just want to say, you know, she was she was like 17 years old. It's not her fault what happened. It was whoever did the act to Adam's fault what happened. Was there contributory negligence? Possibly. But she she was certainly not the one to place the blame on. But let's talk about what she said. She was now saying for sure that there had been a disturbance between two boys two white boys and two black boys and basically that she had asked the black boys if their parents were still in the store and they said no so she told them to exit via the north entrance and then she asked the two white boys the same thing and that the older one said no and the other the younger one assumedly adam said nothing so she ordered them out the east exit so she said that it was 30 minutes later that she heard that Adam's name was being paged. So if you think about it, Adam had been, been ejected to a part of the mall or the parking lot at what she wasn't familiar because when Reve went to see her, she always parked in the same spot. This also left six-year-old Adam vulnerable to anyone outside who was driving by the Sears. In 1996, the police went back to that wooden footbridge at mile marker 174. It was mile marker 130 at the time, so it was 15 years later. They searched for blood evidence on the footbridge. However, the investigators discovered that the footbridge was not in its original condition anymore. It had been 15 years. As the years progressed, more people, witnesses came forward that ID'd Tool. There were also more witnesses that came forward and ID'd Jeffrey Dahmer. Years later, Mary Hagen said that she saw Tool next to the kids at the video game and that he stunk really bad and that he was talking to Adam. Now note, there were some kids that didn't see any adults around. Also, in January of 1996, a Christian minister called in to America's Most Wanted tip line and stated that he was told by an inmate that Otis Toole had killed Adam Walsh. So that was hearsay. But he also did say that it was, quote, common knowledge around the prison that Toole had been the murderer of Adam Walsh. On May 5, 1995, the Mo Mobile Press Register in Alabama filed suit against the Hollywood Police Chief Richard Witt to review the Adam Walsh files. The police initially refused, saying that it was an open investigation, and so 
three other news organizations joined in to open the Adam Walsh files. Florida's public record laws protect the public's right to know. It's our Sunshine Act under Florida Statutes Chapter 119 of our Public Records Law. But there are some exemptions. There's exemptions and ongoing criminal investigations. And seemingly, and in my opinion, okay, most of the people, most of the investigators, the police, they thought Tool was the killer and the prime suspect in Adam's death. But the circumstantial evidence was not there at the time to support the state of Florida filing a charge against him, okay? So since Tool had not been charged with the crime, and the case had started to go cold, the state of Florida opted to allow this cold case to be released to the public in full. So eventually, the entire case file was released in full because they claimed the Hollywood Police Department couldn't reasonably claim that the case was still active after 15 years and they didn't have anything new going on with it. The judge ruled that neither the prosecutors nor the, nor the Walshes, those were the parties fighting the file being released, neither had proved that an arrest or presentation to a grand jury was imminent or that opening the files would jeopardize any future arrest or prosecution. The Walshes said, We are gravely wounded and bitterly disappointed that a judge in Florida has decided that a newspaper's demand to see the police file in our son's case is more important than finding his killer. Once the case file was released, the newspapers got a hold of it and they scrutinized the case and they talked about all the different suspects and all the things that was wrong with the case and all the missing evidence and they splashed it all over the newspapers. It was also revealed that Tool had been writing nasty letters and I say Tool writing, he was allegedly illiterate, he could sign his signature but he would have inmates prison buddies write nasty letters to john walsh wanting say five thousand dollars for quote-unquote good faith money given to a quote-unquote private lawyer for information where the bones of adams was located with a promise a contract to give a further forty five thousand dollars after the bones were retrieved and walsh passed on the offer it was also revealed that tool wrote the orlando sentinel and the national Enquirer. He wrote these little letters, essentially looking for money for interviews. Tool was not well in prison, and Barry Gamelli, a hospital administrator at the Union Correctional Institution, when Tool died, said that allegedly, when Tool was placed in the infirmary, the staff were under directions not to discuss Tool with the media, attorneys, or law investigators. Barry said that Tool was talking and it was relayed on to the superintendent and to the prison investigator and that Tool allegedly spoke with the medical director and two nurses that he died on September 15th, 1996 of cirrhosis of the liver and hepatitis, but before so that he made a deathbed confession. He also made a deathbed confession to his niece, Sarah Patterson, so she's the niece of Otis Tool. And she said that Tool admitted to her that he had murdered Adam. So she visited with Otis in December of 1995 and later while he was on his deathbed in 1996. She said that she both loved and hated Tool. See, because his lover, Henry Lee Lucas, was he killed her, her sister, Frida. And so she said that while Tool confessed to killing Adam Walsh, he refused to say where he put the body. And that she said, Uncle Otis, are you the one that killed Adam Walsh? And that he said, yeah, I killed the little boy. And I always kind of felt bad about it too. This article is from September 26, 1996. And it says, this is from John Walsh. The Hollywood police didn't even know he was dying. It's just mind boggling that someone that wasn't a cop didn't go in there and talk to Tool. In 2008, John Rave hired a retired detective, Joe Matthews, to review the released 10,000 page State of Florida case file on their son and to perform his own investigation, leaving no stone unturned. Joe Matthews concluded that Otis Tool was the killer of Adam Walsh. He was sure of this after he located an unprocessed roll of film from the case file that purported to show an imprint in blood 
of Adam's face. So this would have been from the back floorboard of that 1971 Cadillac. Reve believes that this is the face of her child. The Hollywood Police Department allegedly looked over all his information that he had uncovered and compiled and they determined that the summary Matthews made convinced them that they had enough circumstantial evidence to convict Audis Tool had he been alive. So who killed Adam Walsh? Those who don't believe Tool was a killer cite that when he initially confessed Adam's description was wrong, his clothes were wrong, his age was wrong, even his hair color was wrong, that Tool was unable to ID Adam's photo, and that initially Tool placed Henry Lee Lucas in the narrative while Nuke Lucas was in jail, and that Tool tailored all his confessions to suit the facts as they were revealed to him. Some people believe that Jeffrey Dahmer did it, but then by that token you have to have him being off work at the t on that day, have him accessing a van that he wasn't supposed to access, have him drive to Hollywood, commit the murder, clean the van or no get no blood in the van, bring the van back, have the van not be missing, and then have him lie about it. Now, did Dahmer lie? Yes, he did lie. I do believe he lied, but I don't know if he cleared his conscience at the end or not. I do not know. John and Reve Walsh believe that Tool did it. Joe Matthews believes Tool did it. Now the Hollywood Police Department believe Tool did it. And one of these scumbags likely killed Adam Walsh. Both of these scumbags are dead. Donmore was murdered in prison and Tool died in jail. Neither are roaming the earth to do harm to any other child. There is a blessing here and that is Adam's legacy. The family was able to take anger and turn it into activism. The turning point in the story is when John Walsh met with the Broward medical examiner, Dr. Ronald White, because see, John wanted Adam's remains for burial and the Walshes had already conducted an empty casket funeral. And Dr. Wright spoke very frankly to John that Adam's remains were evidence, they were still evidence at that time, and about what John and Reve could do instead to help other missing children. Reve was already mobilized to try and find other missing children. She said, it was a sad thing for this country that the fight had to be led by two broken down parents of a murdered child. Reve Walsh quit school in order to help find other missing children. They first founded the Adam Walsh Child Resource Center. That's a nonprofit organization for missing, abused, and neglected children. A made-for-TV movie, Adam, was made into two miniseries. And the rights were sold for $150,000 to the Walshes. And that helped to fund further the Adam Walsh Resource Center. And after the made-for-TV movie, Adam was aired. There was an additional $40,000 in donations pledged and also some missing children that were shown at in the end of these series were found. The viewers were educated in the concept of stranger danger. John and Reve are still married. They also had three more children after Adam's passing. Adam's legacy sparked many changes in the laws as parents became tireless advocates for missing children and women. The Walshes knew that a system needed to be implemented to help track missing children and that nothing currently existed to do so. John supported Republican Senator Paula Hawkins in introducing legislation to create a central database system to track these missing children. And under Hawkins' proposal, the FBI would be the ones to collect information about the missing children from the local law enforcement agencies. In October of 1982, President Reagan signed into law the Missing Children's Act, which created a national clearinghouse of information in child disappearance cases through the FBI. Children were now put into the FBI's NCIC computer base. John Walsh also worked on implementing VICAP, the Violent Crime Apprehension Program, which is a system for tracking serial murderers. 
almost everybody here that's watched this knows what VICAP is. The Adam Walsh Center then changed its name to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That's a nonprofit organization. Of course, it helps to find missing children, but it also educates parents, teachers, and law enforcement on how to best protect children. So the NCMEC circulates photos of missing children. They assist law enforcement organizations in finding them, and they also provide resources and support for the families of those missing children. In 2006, on the 25th anniversary of Adam's disappearance, President Bush signed the Adam Walsh Child Protection Act, which expanded the National Sex Offender Registry, created a new child abuse registry, and strengthened the penalties for crimes against children. John Walsh also went on to be the host and the executive producer of America's Most Wanted, a national syndicated television program that aired on the Fox network for 23 years, then it was aired on the Lifetime network, and they captured approximately 1,100 fugitives. And after the last season of America's Most Wanted, he also went on to be involved with the programs In Pursuit with John Walsh and The Hunt with John Walsh. I think we can all agree that this is an amazing legacy for this beautiful little boy and that perhaps something good did come out of all of this. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video to be informative and please leave your comments and your opinions in the comments section below. And without further ado, have an excellent day. Bye.